Thank you for coming on. You are West Side Bear, <laughs> the infamous West Side Bear. Um, <laughs> the legendary West Side Bear. Um, what? Where? How did you get that bear name? Well, it was my uh, is a nickname, and then it became like a call sign on online. Well, West Side Jack was my my nickname that people gave me my old friends and then that turned into you know i had a west side jack youtube account and then owen was doing bear names so i just turned it into west side bear and i live west of nothing well yeah <laughs> west of knoxville <laughs> yeah yeah no, never a gang. it's a very silly lore let me uh sorry turn that off Am I still here? Yep. Okay. No, I like that. I like sticking true to your roots, like to your to your old school nicknames. Yeah. And bear names are just interesting in general. Like, I do like that. That some are just like seem almost random, and some are like this is has this real deep meaningful story, and some people are just <laughs> yeah. like ah, I just kind of liked it. <laughs> <laughs> just sounded cool. I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> And then that's yeah. just your name that people know you as <laughs> forever. You yeah, like, were like, from like California? I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> yeah, thankfully not. Although that's a good yeah. mission, that's a good mission field. <laughs> yeah. I have, yeah. Um, I do at times, I've talked about this on my, on my stream before, but I do truly feel like God brought me to Tennessee. For a lot mm -hmm. of reasons some of it's made sense some of it still is like almost like a mystery but part of me too like almost like my my ego my selfish self like almost feels bad or like regretful that i didn't stay in california for that mm -hmm. to like bloom where i was planted you know like it is a, oh, yeah. it is a great mission field like it's the darkness so what a great place to like be a light and now i feel like in tennessee like yeah there's people that need to hear the gospel and need to like have someone good in their life <laughs> shine light into their into them onto them through them but uh yeah it's yeah just to hear just it's more like you're dealing with lukewarm christians and you're trying to like revive their faith or rekindle their faith whereas like in california there's people that just have never encountered an actual christian they they know yeah. the char characterization of it or whatever they like have heard about them they've seen maybe the hypocrisy or the stuff on tv about them you know but like they don't actually like have a friend in their life that is a christian so part of me too is like oh man i, I need to go back oh man i'm missing out on <laughs> yeah. daniel in babylon you know <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i, I get that it's an interest i mean so you're from california Kind of. You I'm probably I'm originally Illinois, but then my okay. whole family moved out to California, and then I lived there for nine years, almost nine okay. years. So nice. it's easy just to say I'm from California, but then it's kind of like, well, asterisk. <laughs> well, Not actually. Yet. Well, I don't live in Nashville, but if I tell people I live in Nashville, just yeah. because that's what you say if you live within 100 miles of Nashville. <laughs> yeah. Hello, it's, you know, it's going to start being not cool. <laughs> used to be cool to say that. Now it's going to be people, almost like when you come from California, you're like almost kind of don't want to say that out loud. <laughs> you don't Kanye, that. Yeah, Kanye called out Nashville for being a little too... Uh, he said we were controlled by Jews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see it. The old Vanderbilt family has dirty little fingers in, the, <laughs> in all the right places. Yeah. yeah, right there in the center of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is, it is kind of a... I mean, you can just tell it's a very, like, disgusting money town. Like, bigger picture. <laughs> <laughs> just just what i've heard yeah. like there's not a lot of difference in from like la to here it still is kind of like that big money really rules the scene and you have like a, yes 
the small fish that are trying to make it and they're having fun and they might find some success or whatever. But it really is like a big fish pond. Um, yeah, it's L.A. for musicians to yeah. come in like <laughs> able play bars, trying to get a big roll, big break. And then, you know, Satan takes some men under his wing. <laughs> you know, it's like, you're very talented. Yeah. <laughs> sign here. So, yeah, sign on this dotted line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There is a, there's like, it's very true. I mean, like, there's a lot of wickedness in Nashville. There's also a lot of heart. That's one of the things I'm starting to really appreciate about, like, uh, um, cities where i had kind of more of a disgust for them and i'm not a city guy but i'm just i don't know there's a there's a real uh spunk and a heart to a city that i appreciate and um nashville has got there's somewhere in nashville is a a, a beating heart you know <laughs> so it's like it really, uh, it's, it's got it, it's lost it's a lot of its charm over the years like I mean, I, it's hard to explain how much Nashville has changed since we got we moved here in '92, and it's like a different world. It's like the difference between Birmingham and Atlanta now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Even Birmingham's getting changing quickly, right? Being like pretty gentrified yeah. and hip, hipstered out, hipped up. Yeah, we got all those slender condos that go up, you know, three stories. <laughs> yeah. They demolish a house and they build two houses that are skinny and right next to each other. Like, <laughs> we could double our profit off this and make it, like, look kind of cool and sell it to idiots. <laughs> yeah, make make it cheap and make it look cool for the next 10 years until it yeah. falls apart. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I, would, I I delivered for a long time. Uh, excuse me. Um, I delivered for a, like a materi construction material to just anywhere. And, and I did spend a lot of time downtown delivering to these uh, homes, these gentrified homes. Uh, they're, they're just tearing, they're just watching tear down these old houses as kind of upsetting and I, I felt like a kind of a jerk driving around in this truck with all these materials looking at all the families like Bye. yeah <laughs> yeah make way yeah. for the californians <laughs> they're coming <laughs> yeah yep Sad. so you'll get Sadly. your opportunity to uh, to evangelize the californians because they're all here now uh, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of what i was thinking too like actually as i was saying that is now that yeah. I think of it, and it really is like my, I'm in three different Bible studies and like pretty much everyone's not from here. You meet someone nah. in like 20s, 30s, 40s, and it's like, the joke was San Diego used to be, when I lived in San Diego, it was like a transplant city. And it was well known for that. And the joke was like, when you meet someone, the first question you ask is, where are you from? Because no one's actually from San Diego. And it would be rare. Yeah. Like if you were like, where are you from? People would go... Oh, I'm actually from San Diego. <laughs> oh, like yeah. I'm one of those weirdo, like 5% of the city that's actually <laughs> from here. And I feel like that's starting to happen in Nashville. Like you really can like yeah. go to a Bible study and I meet someone and it's like, oh, what's your name? Where are you from? And it is almost weird for them to be like, oh, I'm, I'm actually from Franklin. I'm actually, I'm just down the road and, you know, wherever, Murfreesboro. But um, yeah. That's not a good sign. I don't know if that's a good sign. <laughs> I know I'm part of the problem, but I don't think it's a good sign. No, you know, I, 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 was, I had to overcome my own, like, annoyance with the whole thing. But honestly, God's shown it to me. It's just a great opportunity to, uh, to show. Because uh, what am I going to do about it? You know, really, it's like, so it's an opportunity to show kindness and not hostility towards uh, foreigners which I consider a, a lot of these people foreigners in yeah. this strange land yeah. but um and I because I was too at one point you know I'm kind of a, a bit of a nomad myself I've lived in a lot of different places but um yeah yeah it's um 
yeah it's 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 wild i mean just cities in general like i have a stream coming up i'm gonna do like about mouse utopia and kind of like what mm -hmm. the bible has to say about cities and living in cities and it's not yeah. it's not great you know <laughs> and i've just always been a city boy i'm a born and raised like you know my hometown wasn't like it wasn't chicago but it was a big city in illinois like champaign illinois it's like a big college town um, yeah and it's like it definitely is like a big city not i mean I, that's, I don't know the right way it's a city that's fairly large and surrounding it is like cornfields like small town very like mm. you don't see anything <laughs> just flat and it's just yeah. corn but that was like it was like two worlds it was like my world was like i'm in champagne and i would never go out there to like the country like that's weird that's crazy why would you live out there in the middle of nowhere it's so boring and stupid i want to live in <laughs> champagne or it's fun and everyone's there and having you know things are easy <laughs> and so then i moved to san diego the name champagne, that sounds the what you know just even the name champagne yeah <laughs> yeah it sounds like they're trying too hard that's my, my hometown is uh wants to be big it's always wanted to be bigger than it actually is, too. You know, it's always wanted to be Chicago when it wasn't. But, you know, then I moved to San yeah, Diego, well, LA. It's always wanted to be Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're getting a wish. Just... <laughs> well, that's why I feel like people here are like, oh, yeah, we, we love that Nashville's getting bigger. You know, it's more money. It's more stuff. It's more opportunities. And I kind of am like, is that a good thing? <laughs> yeah. Is more good? Is, is bigger good? You know, like at the end of the day is more money is better, like t earthly physical stuff <laughs> and ease and comfort, a good thing. And the more and more I like yeah. look into it seriously, it seems like it's not. It seems like that leads you away from God. Yeah, it is. I always thought that um, America seemed to be missing such a great opportunity because it's like it seems that it requires persecution to grow close to God. But I was like, what if we could do it without persecution? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. what if, like, what, why do we have to keep waiting on like uh, uh, the walls closing in to be like, oh, dad's coming home. We got to clean the house. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a perfect, yeah. That's like a perfect uh, allegory. Cause I do, yeah. I feel like people do like they, they are like, oh, any day now, Christ is going to return. You know, it's like they can't wait for it. They're counting the days. You know, yeah. it's like, well, just he has returned. He's in you. <laughs> yeah. The Holy Spirit is here. He's with you. Like, live like that, truly. But, yeah, I always wanted to get like a shirt. Like, you know, people like I, I was in this church and they had like a, a frame of like Jesus wept, the verse. And I always wanted to get like a frame that just says Jesus left. <laughs> It's like he left. Yeah, he's gone. He but he's also with us, you know. But he's he left. Yeah, whatever that means. There's so much stuff in the Bible that like I don't even claim to understand. Yeah. That's why I feel like a lot of people. I'm I'm thankful for people who study do like theology. I'm interested in it. I'm very interested in it, and um, I wish I had more time to do it myself. Um, but it's like. I don't know, people who are super certain of their doctrine, there's some things that are like, you know, to be certain about, but like, um, I don't know, there's just a lot of doctrinal certitude that is just kind of off-putting. It's like, are you sure? Yeah. Talk to somebody from like, and not to throw stones, I know many people, great people from all denominations, but like Church of Christ is pretty hardcore. And it's like, y'all are pretty serious about this. <laughs> like, yeah. Every, are you sure everybody else is going to hell? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, because I'm such a new Christian, like I was born and raised 28 years, just a total non-believer. And I encounter, encounter God, encounter Christ, life is totally transformed, but I was still just like on my own. Like I was just a guy with a Bible in his hand, totally tra transforming his entire life. Like I didn't have people like discipling me i didn't have a church i think some people like they walk into a church for the first time and that that's how they're converted and that's like you have all these people now around you 
you're now a part of a new family and they're the ones that are like teaching you and correcting you and answering your questions. And I was like, I have a Bible and I have like podcasts. I can like YouTube, Google search, you know? And so it kind of like <laughs> yeah. took me in every direction because I would like look up like, what does this mean? And I would like in all, in, in genuine faith, like in genuine, with genuine heart, like seek out everyone's responses. Like what do the Orthodox have to say about this? What do the Catholics have to, what do the Baptists say? What is, you know, so I was kind of, getting everyone's different perspectives about like theology and i still do that like i actually do think that's healthy i think that it really is the way we should be approaching it is that an open (laughs) mind (laughs) yeah an open mind and an open heart seeking the truth right seek and you shall find but some people just get so wrapped up in their denomination either the one they chose or the one they were raised in you know it's like this is the truth i know it and therefore everything else is I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to speak about it. I don't want to associate with anyone like, like from them, you know, it's just your in group preference, which, yeah. okay. If that's, you know, if that is honestly, truly what's bringing you in, into a relationship with, with God, like, great, uh-huh. do that. <laughs> but I just, yeah. in general, bigger picture for most people, I don't think that's the right way, the healthy way to go about it. Yeah. I'm with you. It's funny too. Cause like we, in a response to a lot of what you're talking about, you know, we, I grew up, what my church did was like, you know, does, that's where the non-denomination, you know, not, you know, what kind of denomination are you? It'd be like, we're non-denominational. Yeah. But, and that's what I grew up in, but that just turned into a denomination itself. So it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't, yeah. like, let's just follow God. <laughs> just, yeah. just trying to get try to figure out and that's been really what's changed uh, like like I'm not a universalist and I, I feel like I'm kind of on a different path than a lot of people are right now I'm on a different path than I was six months ago yeah. you know and it's like because I'm, I'm not a universalist, but mainly because I believe in the power of choice that God gave us. But I'm closer to a universalist than I ever have been. And that's kind of saying something. And maybe that's naive, but I don't really even care. Because it's like I'm so focused on how good God is that like I don't I almost don't. I kind, of, I kind of I don't know. I feel like that's that's just where my focus has been at recently. Cause I was always focused on like the, like I, I was trying to corner, you know, read through the scripture and make sure like, okay, got my T's crossed and my eyes dotted to make sure I'm not the bad part. You know, I'm not, okay, I'm not in the bad part. I'm not in the bad part. Maybe I'm in this bad part, you know, like reading the Bible like that and like trying to like, uh, self-correct. I'm not saying self-correction is bad, but what I'm seeing now more is, is like, I was skipping over all the good parts, yeah. you know, I was like, and so whenever it's, and so, the, uh, and it's, I'm not trying to say that other parts of the Bible aren't important. I believe they are. And they're like a call to sobriety. Um, but once there is a, and this is me, of course, but, um, once there is a, um, uh, a blessed assurance that uh, then I just really I don't even read the bad parts I just I'm like where's the good part and I go to it and I gotta read that I mean I you know read things in context but and I don't know and people are like oh you cherry pick this and you cherry pick that I'm like I, I don't understand how you're not supposed to cherry pick but <laughs> I feel like that's a really I mean people do that I suppose but like uh, um but you're also talking to the guy, of course, who infamously defended um, Joel Osteen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you always have like very, what I would consider a quote unquote controversial takes as a Christian. And then really <laughs> what that means is like you're sane. <laughs> really what that means is like you're very like sane and you practice what you preach. You know, allegedly, I'm alleged, alleged to be sane, which is nice. <laughs> but I mean, like, so that whole Joel Olsen thing, 
um, you know, you talk to, I mean, he's, he's a punchline in my circles, you know, all my like, my um, Baptist, Protestant friends, you know, because they view him as like someone who's giving like Protestants a bad name. You know, they mm-hmm. view him as someone who's leading people to, to hell. He's tricking them, you know, and he becomes a punchline. He becomes a person to hate. You know, oh, I hate him. And we really don't like, we, we oppose him. And it's like, guys, <laughs> are we defining ourselves now by hatred? Like we're supposed to just hate people? Like he's a man. Yeah. He's a man with a soul. And you can disagree with him. You can think whatever you want about him. But at the end of the day, like, we should be praying for him. We should be trying, we yeah. should be encouraging him to do what's right instead of like spewing hatred and animosity towards him to what convince him he's wrong. Like he's not gonna listen, that's not gonna yeah. work. You know, and as Christians, like what are the two, the two greatest commandments? Love God, love your neighbor. And if you're sitting here uh-huh. like hating Joel Olstein, are you doing either of those? <laughs> you know right. you could twist it and make a weird argument i guess like i'm loving my neighbor by stopping a wolf in sheep's clothing or whatever but like yeah be real be honest like are, are is is this spirit inside you right now something from god or is it something from the enemy you know but um yeah, yeah. I just love you're like you're just like saint and then people are just like no you have to hate him no you have to oppose yeah. him no you have to and it's like uh pretty sure that's not i don't have to do anything <laughs> uh person <laughs> you know yeah yeah man it's true i mean i just i don't know usually when i it's like i see a bunch of things going this way then i'm like i'll at least poke at it the other direction because yeah. i'm like i'm not like you know i'm not his judge but i was like there's nobody else is defend. Nobody's defending Joel Osteen, so I just like took up for him. People were like, "But he shut down his thing," and it's like, "But people, I don't know. People say a lot of things just because they don't like the look of somebody. And they're like, well, he's rich and he has a smile, and I hate that. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I understand it goes. But people are like, oh, he talks about the prosperity gospel. I don't know, man. I'm just like, what are we supposed to suck? Like, I feel like the prosperity guy, I don't, I don't really know. I don't know. Like, I don't know what the prosperity gospel even is. Yeah, I think it's, I feel um, like people think they know what it is, but they maybe, and yeah. I'm not t- necessarily talking about you. People just use prosperity gospel as a hammer to, but it's like pretty meaningless to me. I feel like people, like the, 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 and that's my whole issue is like, if I was going to critique a church that I do it in truth and in love, like Paul, you know, <laughs> but, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, I feel like most of it is just kind of, kind of putting all you know, whatever. I, I don't. I don't really care that much about Joel Osteen. I just think it's and it was just kind of interested me at the time how much people hated him. Yeah. We had some. Like that's another thing too is like like he wouldn't call these people who are like prosperity gospel preachers. That's us calling them that. They're mm-hmm. not calling themselves that. They believe that they're yeah. preaching the true gospel. And so, like, okay, again, yeah. like, we're coming at it with, like, this, you're t- you're preaching the wrong gospel. It's called, the, you know, you're preaching prosperity gospel. And, I mean, honestly, like, yeah. yes, fact. Like, because, you know, who's in the chat? Slap in the chat says, prosperity gospel is praying for earthly rewards. And that's pretty much what it is. It's this mentality of, like, people who are trying to live their best life now as Christians so they're trying to like use God basically to live well now. And clearly like to me, mm-hmm. that's not what the Bible teaches. I mean, if you just kept reading your Bible on your own, you would see over and over again, we are not promised <laughs> a good and healthy and wealthy conflict free life, you know, but what's the problem with wanting that, 
You know, like don't make it if you if you're not making it an idol. If it, you're not if it's not leading you into sin, or leading you away from God, why isn't wanting mm-hmm. hope and blessings a good thing? Like if you're honestly truly like praying for blessings. Am I supposed to like slander you and call you a prosperity gospel person? Like you should be desiring suffering and pain and <laughs> hardships for all the days of your life here on the in your time on this earth. I, I I'm gonna go yeah. out on and say that's a bit extreme. <laughs> but then maybe the opposite. Yeah, you should be whipping yourself in the back and yeah. giving me all your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll take your worldly possessions if you think they're so bad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh you know i'm just saying it's like be about it are you the are you the rich young ruler who uh jesus told to give everything away uh, if you're giving it away i could use some of it so yeah. <laughs> yeah. if you're trying to you know fit a you know camel through a needle i'm your guy give me your stuff yeah <laughs> you know that's what kind of i don't know that kind of stuff triggers me a bit people are like so high and mighty about like rich people i'm not rich i got five five dollar uh blind behind me you know what i mean <laughs> and a, and a door here that's like made out of like you know two pieces of plywood i'm like i'm fine i'm doing well but i'm just yeah. saying if you're rich and you're really about all this stuff and you just want to go live in the woods and you know pray to god go for it but i'll take your stuff <laughs> You're like, I need new blinds. I will take your blinds. Yeah. Yeah. On your way out of town into the woods, give me your blinds. Yeah. Oh, slap, <laughs> slap Weasel in the chest. Said, God is not a vending machine. I love that. Get yeah, he's not. On my chest, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you could be my vending machine. <laughs> I can't see the chat, so I don't know what people are saying. But But I get that because I I float between all types of Christians. And so I'm in this hilarious position where, like, when I'm with my Catholic bros and they're trash and Protestants, I have to be like, hey, guys, we're all on the same team. Like, we're yeah, we're different. Yeah, Yeah, we believe some different stuff. But, like, at the end of the day, is your enemy Satan? (laughs) Do you worship and love and serve God, your creator? Like, okay, we're on the yeah. same team, you know? And we can disagree with stuff and go to different places on Sunday and wear different clothes and, you know, whatever. Have little d- disputes and debates about certain things. But then it's like, the, it's just yeah. every group I go to. I go to my ortho bros and they're bashing the Catholics and the Protestants. I go to my Protestant friends and they're bashing Mormons and, and ev- you know, just everyone. And I'm just kind of in the middle, like, like you like i wouldn't call myself a universalist really um but it i people would call me that because i'm not like so hard-headed about this is the correct correct gospel the correct theology no exceptions yeah. to me it's like there is i like a, but... a gospel and then everyone else like mm-hmm. apparently has an opinion about it and that's fine as long as it doesn't lead you mm-hmm. away from spiritual reunion with your creator and so that call, yeah. I get called a hippy dippy universalist or whatever because I'm like I believe Catholics are saved I believe Orthodox are saved you know I believe there's a lot of different quote unquote Christians that are saved but like mm-hmm. I don't know <laughs> being tolerant of differences apparently is uh, not cool these days <laughs> maybe not ever but. yeah because you got to find your special niche of. 500 people who are going to heaven and everybody else just just can suck it you know it's like <laughs> that's what like i don't know like a lot of there's denominations that just don't even they're like well i'm going to hell because there's only like you know what does it say in revelation about like was it what is the number it's like two hundred and fifty thousand people are going to heaven or something like that they're like well i'm not on the list for sure yeah it's like, <laughs> Like, what are you doing then? It's, like, it's my whole thing about, like, uh, Calvinists. It's like, I feel like, I don't even, I can't, I think I'm probably too tired to talk about Calvinism. If, if you want to, if you, I could probably make a comment on it if you felt so inclined to go there. But um, I would probably, oh, I can of worms that I, I don't have the brain power to unpack. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... 
kind of what you were saying earlier about like the you know when you read the bible well first of all like i want to say earlier about you're like taking the bible out of context or cherry picking every single mm-hmm. christian does that i mean when you pull up a verse you know and you're like reading it <laughs> for motivation or you're like what does the you type into google i do this all the time too and i have to like check myself where it's like what does the bible have to say about forgiveness and you know there's 20 quotes about forgiveness well you just got 20 out of context quotes about forgiveness you have no idea (laughs) you could read that and think like you know it's it'll say something like i just recently did this a few months ago where it's like it's it's saying forgive your brothers and sisters what's the context does that mean everybody does that mean just someone who's asking for it or does that mean like your brothers and sisters in the faith like there's no context there so you have to read yeah. the whole Bible for context, but also like, I can't quote you the whole Bible right now. <laughs> you know, Jesus didn't just repeat <laughs> scriptures to people. He taught in parables. You know, he cherry picked concepts to, to, to teach people what was important in the moment. So there's no like shame in that. Yeah. There's no shame in taking a verse and using it for some reason, for motivation, for inspiration to teach. But like, you also do need to take a step back and remember the context as well or the bigger picture. You know, the Bible isn't just a collection of, yeah. of one word phrases, you know, it like is books for a reason, but also like, there's no, yeah. I, know. Right. I got into a phase there where I just every night would open to a random page of the Bible and just read like two chapters. And it was like the most amazing, you know, every time almost, it was like, you're opening to the right page and getting the right lesson for you at the moment. You know, is that cherry picking yeah. the Bible because I'm not reading it verse by verse all the way through. I didn't start with Joshua 1 and read Joshua 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Like, is there a right way to read and understand God's word? Like, I would say no. <laughs> but again, maybe there are people that do. Apparently, I don't even think so. the... Uh, I don't even think the um, the New Testament is in uh, chronological order, or however you would say. Pretty sure it's... So I don't know. Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> I think you know. I like what uh, Bill Johnson said. He said, "My theology is Jesus." Yeah. <laughs> Good enough for me, man. No, like that, that's um, too simple. That can't possibly, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I really believe, man. What what's been on my heart recently is like really because I feel like people want to ev- and. I exist here, you know, in my head. My, I, I, um, like I have, I have heart. I have a lot of heart, but like, I think too much, and um, <laughs> so it's like I always needed something to be accepted here, so it could rest here. You know, you can't see me, right? <laughs> no, I can see you. Oh, I can see you. Okay. Every yeah. So. Okay. Except something in my head so it could rest in my heart. Yep. It's kind of how I operate. And um, But beyond that, I believe that there should be experiences that are happening with people who are asking, you know, who, are, who want to know God, who want to know Jesus. And I think that it's like, is there's something uh, that it's like people think that they can explain away the gospels and you can teach on it that can help the mind accept things uh that can rest in heart and that's important jesus spent a lot of his time teaching concepts you know that so, so people could ponder on it in their mind and then eventually could find them in into their its way into the heart um uh but there's something about the most powerful thing about the gospels to me is the stooping it's the enfleshment of god and and flesh you know it's like that is uh it's why other religions deny it is real because it's like it's god doing something beneath him but i always um you know because there's something about the um the eyes of jesus that like changed people you know it's like uh it talks about like he who is it that he said he fixed i think he was the the uh the old uh, or the uh was it what do you call him the young the guy who he said to sell everything is it the rich young ruler i believe yeah 
he says he fixed his his gaze upon him and in the uh with the lady uh who was about to be stoned uh like he got low down to her eyes and there's something about the stooping nature of jesus to get as low as possible um to catch us in the eyes yeah and um to with that experience and then it even taught you know and then there's this un this um you know john i love john because he identifies himself in his own gospel as he didn't call himself john he just calls himself the one who jesus loved yeah <laughs> it's very yeah. beautiful i mean and it's like he's not saying he didn't love other people but it's he's he's like taking advantage of something special that he had uh, to really point out something very special that I believe John was hoping the reader would understand is for them too. And that's him talking about being on the breast of Jesus made me like uncomfortable to read it. You know, when I was younger, the older I'm getting, especially this year, I'm telling you, like I've, I've changed a lot this year. It's been, it was started out as a pretty rough year but it's turned into something very beautiful. I'm looking forward to what next year has, yeah. but like, oh, yeah. um, but this idea of, it, you know, being in the bosom of Jesus or being on the breast of Jesus, it's like so intimate. It made me like uncomfortable to read it. Um, but I think that's what John was just like, Oh, they can make fun of me if they want. I don't care. Uh, I hope they understand this. I hope they can find this themselves. And uh, because it's this like the perversions of the world, you know, scale the eyes from seeing innocence. You know, it's like um, it's kind of it's like um, I don't know. I I was about to take a hard left, but um, (laughs) I think that's what I. I, But that you know, but going back to the the mind, um, I think beyond theology and apologetics is experience i think experience is the one undeniable thing and that if you're praying for somebody pray that i I pray you know this is just me but just like i pray people's heart be tender towards a revelation of christ i think that even why the book of revelation is has puzzled so many people is because it's the revelation of jesus christ it's it's the revelation that I think every revelation man has, whether it's about this or that, is about Jesus Christ becoming more clear, becoming unveiled, you know. And I, and this is where you, I probably lose a lot of people because people are so excited for the world to burn. But I don't, <laughs> I don't really have a solid theology on that. Like I, I um. I feel like the Bible kind of says this and it kind of says that about different things. And that's why there's, are you pre or post trib kind of a conversation? I'm like, well, I don't know. (laughs) I don't really care. I'm planning to live forever now because I believe I am living forever now. And I think that, um, if that concept could truly take hold, I think that we could, uh, through, Well, you know, it says as in Corinthians, I believe it's that um, as we behold him as in a mirror uh, or like a mirror, as in, as if, what is this verse? I can't, it's kind of hard for me to say. It's like we behold him as in a mirror, we become like he is. I think that's like it. I think that is my entire theology now is to, to behold him as in a mirror to become like he is. And this is where, you know, I always like try to find like, where's the closest I can be to heresy without it being heresy. And if I cross over, as long as I'm not blaspheming the Holy spirit, I think I'm okay. Um, But it's like, how good can good get? And I'll imagine that. And this is where I like, I have a problem with the doomer, like kind of, I, what I think is poor man's theology. It's like such an aversion. It's like, 
people get so mad at people like Joel Osteen for what I think is poor. I'm not even, this is not about me defending Joel Osteen's theology because I frankly don't really know what it is. Um, but I think people get so upset at prosperity gospel that they, they are like, no, the world must burn. Um, and I can't wait for it to burn so I can go to heaven. I'm like, but didn't Jesus tell us to pray that his kingdom come yeah. on earth as it is in heaven? Yeah. We I'm like, do we not kingdom so, here? Yeah. That's what that's, I'm kind of like, what are we doing? I mean, like if God needs to, you know, no stern, the stone will be un, unturned and fine. Then, then he can demolish my kingdom. Uh, and then I'll build with him again. Whatever, you know, the new heaven and the new earth, whatever all this stuff means, I'm down for it, but I'm just not into this, like, uh, well, we just have to kind of hide out until everything burns down. Uh, and, you know, I don't like, you know, I think it's, we're more than conquerors. We're uh, kings and priests. Yeah. And I think there's something very powerful about that that people are missing, but I believe people are... I think there's a real move of people waking up to what God is. And I believe that God is family. I believe, he, you know, he could have made this place and he could have made this realm in any way he wanted to. But he made it in such a way where, like, I can't look out the window and not see grass that has begotten grass, you know, or a tree that has begotten a tree and a seed, you know, you know, could that if you have enough imagination, you can see a forest. So it reproduces after its own kind. And he said in heaven, we, you know, we will be like the angels and we won't do it like we do here. But here I am a father. I have a daughter. And I have a wife and there's this like vertical relationship that um, that I have a father that I'm a son and I am a father and I have a child. So it's like there's clearly a message here of generations that speaks of a vertical thing. And then you have a horizontal, you have brothers and sisters and you have husbands and wives and then you have fathers, sons grandchildren there's like a you know and i mean you even have a cross there i'm making a cross with my gesture here but um there's something very powerful about that and you know and people will look to the old testament or they'll they'll and they'll say well you are not like god because nobody is like god i'm like because <clears throat> then they quote the they quote and like, satan said you will be like god knowing good from evil i'm like well, like if you were two verses before that, God literally said, let's make men our image and likeness. So, yeah. yes, you are like God and you do look like your father because that's literally how you made us with these genes. Or like you have a child and the child looks like you. Yeah. I'm like, it's how we made it to be. And that's who we are. It's like the image bearers. It's, you know, so if you've seen me, you've seen Christ. Like that's I think the whole point. Is what even the Holy Spirit is. And I know I'm on like a whole like rant right now, but like no, it's like it. you have um is you have a, you know, Jesus left and he said, I'm sending the comforter, the, the Father will send the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And it is the witness of his eyes. So we have the gospel and like the book of Acts and you know, and even the epistles of people who saw the eyes of Jesus and it changed the world, it changed their lives and we read that testament of his eyes and it survived for so long but the witness that lives with us of his eyes is the holy spirit that resides in us and i believe that is supposed to become a continual a glory to glory revelation of who he is that becomes so impactful on our lives that we that we have him in our eyes and that we can one day say as it says in corinthians that we look upon him as a, in a mirror and become as he is that we have his eyes and that we are 
if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. And if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. I think that's, I think that's like it. I think that's the entire thing. And it becomes from beholding. It comes from understanding my place with him. It comes from understanding that I'm beloved. And in John 17, dude, like that's a, one of the things I love. It's like they said that, uh, you know, the Lord's prayer is not the Lord's prayer. The Lord, that was for the disciples. <laughs> the Lord's prayer was John 17 when he's talking about let them because he's talking about like that we that the father loves us with the same measure of love that he loved the sinless man and i think that's one of the, i think john 17 is the most profound book for me it's the most profound book in the bible because he he's he, he lays out a clear picture of the will of god and it's to be one to be one you know he's like asking like let them see and he even defines it you know he and i i love jesus because he made everything so simple he's like yeah. i love that he he identified judas as the betrayer then he washed his feet and then he told him love one another as i've loved you and it's like and by that they will know that you're mine and I think that man, that was really just rested on me that I, I don't, I don't feel threatened anymore. I don't feel threatened by, uh, I used to get so like threatened. I felt like, uh, people were coming at me. Um, and I just don't really care anymore. I get more worked up over like stupid stuff about like f college football, NIL deals and stuff. <laughs> like, <I don't, laughs> yeah. like, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah that's that that's all I got to say about that <laughs> love it yeah ramble away man that was great <laughs> I don't know which part I want to tackle first I do love um, I do love how yeah like how uh, you said how simple Jesus made it and like it is so simple <laughs> that it almost feels like a, like a trick. <laughs> Wait, I'm just supposed to like yeah. have faith. <laughs> I'm just supposed to like put my heart in the trust in your hands. Like there's gotta be more. Yeah. Which That's is where I all these different gospels come. It's like these workspace gospels where it's like, no, I have to do this, 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 and this first, or I have to do this. If I don't keep doing this, there's no way that Jesus will love me, you know? And it's his unconditional right. love, and he just wants you. He just wants us. Like, he wants us to return yeah. to him. And it seems it's, like it yeah. can't be possible. <laughs> it can't possibly be that simple, right? And then just in his teachings, yeah. like, things are just made so simple. And then in the disciples, like, in the disciples and the people who wrote the epistles, like, they were all just, like, dudes. They weren't scholars. They weren't... You know, yeah. rich young rulers, they weren't people in power, people with all, all this education, you know, they were like fishermen. And they said that too. They like downplayed themselves every chance they get. Like, I'm just a fisherman. And even John, when he says like, I'm the one Jesus loved the most, he's saying like, he's saying that in the context of I am you. Like, we are the people that Jesus loves the most. Like this person, yeah. who was yeah. the one who Jesus loved yeah. the most? The one who was there. The one who sat there, yeah. like you said, the one who was just there and put his head on his shoulders for rest. That's the yeah. one Jesus loves the most. Not the one who was the, the best athlete or the richest or the most successful. You know, he like who Jesus wanted was just that person there. You know, the other example yeah. I was thinking of is like Martha and Mary. That story where like they're at the house and, you know, Martha is cooking and cleaning. And she's like, even says something to Jesus where she's like, are you going to not, like, Mary's just sitting there doing nothing. Like, what, what, what are you going to do? Jesus, make Mary get up and help me. And Jesus is like, Martha, you don't get it. Like, I don't want you to do stuff to please me. What I want you to do is just what Mary's doing. Like, she's sitting here in my presence. And that to me is like it's the most so great, beautiful, man. simplistic. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like time and time again, you know, Psalm 23. It's like, just, you're a sheep. Just stay next to the shepherd. Just trust him. His rod and staff comforts you. You know, yeah, you're going through the valley, valley of the shadow of death, 
Like, be, just be there with your shepherd. Like, he will lead you to the green pastures. Like, don't get scared. Don't run yeah. off. Don't trust some other guy or your fellow sheep. Just be there in his presence, trusting him, having putting your faith in him, you know? And it's like, again, it's like, it can't be that simple. That's like your instant reaction. It can't be that simple. No, there has to be more to it. <laughs> yeah. There has to be rituals, and I have to do this and this and this. And it's like, no, like time <laughs> yeah. and time again, the gospel is so simple. It's put your faith in me and just be here. Be here with me. Choose to be with me, and I, I will gladly welcome you home into my arms, you know? Yeah. God doesn't want much. He just wants everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. It's glad. Like, what do I have to offer? That's what always confused me when I was a kid. I was like, they're like um, singing songs about like, we lift your name or um, we bless you. I was like, how do I bless God? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as a parent, I understand, you know, because that's the that's what's kind of wild to me is people treat God as if they're a better dad than he is. You know, it's like and and also something I'm realizing is a lot of people weren't born into homes of love and they did turn God into like this angry, selfish, like baby baby boomer parent where he's like <laughs> You know, well, I got to, you know, so if like if in in a meme sense, I'm not trying to talk trash about baby boomers, um, but like it's like you turn God into this guy. It's like um, if the prodigal son was this dad that they think God is, it's like, well, I can't go home yet. I got to like save up some money, you know, like I got to get some things in a row and maybe then he won't be so angry with me when I return. But that's like not the story. It's like, turn your heart towards your father and go home. Yeah. That's all you have to do. And like, this is one of the stories that I've been kind of preaching recently is like this idea of an orphan slave who just works for these people in this world that he just, he doesn't have a family, to, you know, and he doesn't own anything. And what he does, you know, it's just this idea of living in debt and not having a, not knowing your father. And just an allegory for that, where it's just like you're you're working in a field as an orphan slave and you're approached by your older brother who tells you about a family and your father. And he's like, come like you can come with me. And like the, you know, the the Christian point of view is like you, know, you turn and you say, well, like, I can't leave. Um, I'm owned. And, uh, and but then the older brother says, well, this has all been. You know, we're not sneaking out the back. We're going right out the front gate. This has all been taken care of, you know, and then you leave. And then on the way home back to the father, he tells you all about the father and how good the father is and the family that waits for you. And um, and that it is that kind of that idea of, of on the way back home after you've left is is these sneaking ideas of like well, this is just too good to be true you know like i hope it's i hope it's real i just want to i just want to meet the father i want to meet my father i gotta see if this is real because this is just kind of too much but but you know but there's also like another orphan slave who's approached by his older brother who says like come with me we're like leaving you have a family and they're like i have a family no way i get to leave no way. And they don't ask any questions and they're like, let's get out of here, you know, and they just leave. But then a lot of Christians would want to turn. They'd want the good older, older brother to be like, actually, you need to not be so excited. And before we leave, I need you to like feel bad. I need you to, to I need you to uh, repent right now before we leave. And I'm not saying repentance is bad. Repentance is good and necessary. But like people like have it in their head that it has to happen in this certain way. When I'm like, but don't demolish the enthusiasm of people who want to be with their God. Yeah. You know, if if along the way they'll like, you know, a, an ignorant son eventually will be like, wow, like, uh, you know, because you would come to the knowledge of it eventually and be like, wow, this was done for me. 
you know, all this stuff was done. I didn't even have any idea that all this stuff was done for me. I just was so excited. I didn't even think to question anything. Um, I hope that makes sense. I'm just talking about like Jesus, like the, the payment of the cross essentially. And like people wanting to hold that over people's head and be like, this is what he did. Don't you feel like crap? It's like, stop making people feel bad. Uh, with <laughs> yeah. it's like, this is good news. Remember, this is be- this is a yeah. beautiful thing. It's like, um, we can cross these roads, you know, because a lot of things, I think this world, man, it's like the way, like, you know, like you can't look directly into the sun, but people are like, shine the light, shine the light. You know, it's like easy, man. You know, like people are waking up. It's like, like taking like a, you know, like a, like a, flood lamp into somebody's bedroom in the morning and be like wake up you know it's like too much light brother <laughs> too much light you know light is good but like i don't want to like freak people out and, and it usually repels them but the it usually makes them scared of the light, yeah you know like hesitant to go towards it yeah yeah but uh anyways did you have something else that you wanted to talk about <laughs> yeah I love the eyes thing, man. That's that's pretty profound. Because, you know, just how many times in the Bible does it talk about that? Light. Light in a darkness. It's all these, like, parables and allegories about light shining out into darkness. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, all these things about seeing. You know, even Paul, like, on the road to Jamarcus, right? (laughs) 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 On his road to Jamarcus journey, you know? He, like, literally even said it, like, he had scales on his eyes, right? Like, people who refuse God, who refuse to go home to the Creator, they're blind. They're called that. They're blind. They cannot see. They are in the darkness, you know? And then those who encounter Christ have seen. (laughs) It's almost like they have, you know, their their vision is restored. Their sight is, is, is a new sight they've never seen before, you know? It is a lot about, like, seeing, even though, like, you don't see God. You know, you can't see God. I mean, I guess you do see him in creation. Like, you see his fingerprints. You see him working. Mm -hmm. But, like, there is no physical seeing God until the day you do see him. But yet his word is just full of that, is seeing him. Seeing him in the way you treat people, how others treat you how situations arise, like in his creation, like the good, true and beautiful things of this world. Like you see him without even seeing him. I do like that. Dude, I love God. God's so cool. <laughs> I get, <laughs> yeah, God is dope, like, talking about how, like, how, how good he is. It's just so, yeah. and then people, you know, and I, I had this, you know, when I'm talking about like Jamarcus, like listening to like, cause I kind of, sp- we, I spiraled a little bit like, a uh, um, on uh owen uh, uh going at paul and i was like i was like this is retarded or something like that and then then we had like it kind of went at it and uh, um and i apologize i apologize i was out of line but um but because I, I realized i was like dude i'm i'm like i'm like not acting as if i believe like if i believe if if i like i have to like collect like collect myself and be like no like uh I'm, and I, if I know the good news, that means I'm, I know the good news, which means I'm an optimist and I'm not like, I don't have fear response. You know, I have hope and prayer and good news. You know, it's like, it's a, um, and I was I kind of, I was actually grateful because the thing is funny too, because a, a lot of this stuff, I, 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 I really, I don't really want to get into Paul. I guess we can talk about whatever, but um, <laughs> oh, we're getting into Paul. I, I appreciate <laughs> what? Oh, we're getting into Paul. <laughs> okay, that's no, cool. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I appreciated that. I guess in a, a bird's eye view sense, just that it exposed to me a bit of fear that I had. And because uh, I and I think that it can be, it can kind of come from a, it, fear doesn't come from a good place, but um, it can. I don't know. It's like maybe I, I don't know how to say that. 
Um, I guess my motivation seemed uh, decent enough, but um, but the fear manifested in itself that way that kind of exposed something in me that I was glad to get rid of. You know, I was like, oh yeah, I'm being retarded. <laughs> you know, it's like cool. <laughs> like I can go back to being chill and like loving God and having hope for people and having hope for myself. Yeah. You know, it's like I'm I'm good. I'm like okay. <laughs> yeah, well, fear fear is the beginning of wisdom, right? Healthy fear is is mm. is needed. Um, we're talking about that in my Bible study. I've talked about that on my streams too. Is it's like, like the gospel is good news, right? But mm. what is the good news? Like that there is bad news. There was bad news, <laughs> mm. and like yeah. realizing like that you have a savior the first step has to come I need saving right like there's mm. there has to be bad news first there has to be fear first fear of the Lord right like oh no God is real oh no I've been doing everything wrong oh no oh yeah. no it's like fear 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 oh no it's like it's sinking in like I my atheist, my atheist Reddit friends were wrong. <laughs> and I'm a <laughs> sinner, and oh no, you know. But that's, there is a sky daddy. Yeah, oh like God. yeah, sky daddy <laughs> is real. Oh, how many times did I mock him and make fun of him? Oh no. But that's the beauty of the good news. That's yeah. the beauty. Yeah. That's the true beauty. Is that it's like this. This good news comes after you realize I messed up. Oh no, there's going to be consequences. Oh, like, oh no, turns into, oh yes. <laughs> and it kind of has to start with fear. Like that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, you know? Fear of messing up will, will course yeah. correct you. You know, fear of making that same mistake twice will make sure that you don't do it again, you know? But then you can't live in it. You can't linger yeah. in it. You can't let it define you. You can't always be scared of everything. It's like this, the fear needs to start and then it needs to start a process of, overcoming of growing of you know rising up you know it has to be a motivating like emotion that you have not like a defining emotion that you have otherwise you will just live horribly <laughs> you will destroy yourself yeah. um, well that and that's the funny thing about works and faith too it's like what i found is it's like if i can just it's like the closer i get Jesus just beholding him and I'm finding I'm I'm almost being pushed from the back to where the works come af after the faith you know it's like um, and it's and it comes from this happy place it doesn't come from this like anxiety driven like well if I do this then God will love me better you know, it's like, no, I'm coming from this place where it's like, I'm, I feel like I'm in between, like I'm wrapped, like I've, and I'm moving and I'm wrapped in love, just moving towards something. And, and I know that like, if God invested in me, then he's not, I know that he's not a bad investor. And it's, it's so funny too. You said something about like, um, Mm, maybe it'll come to me, but it's it's it just reminded me of the scene. My favorite movie is about um, uh, Jew rats, uh, uh, um, American Tale. Uh, have you seen American Tale? No. What about Feifel? No. <laughs> well, it's about no. it's a cartoon with a bunch of Jewish rats. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> Directed by Steven Spielberg, so. <laughs> You know, he did it, not me. Is but that, uh, there's a... Uh, there's like a book... Is it, is it the cats are Nazis and the, the mice are Jews? No? I, th I don't... I Actually, they're There's Russian, like a graphic so novel that I used to... That I read once that was really cool. I'm blanking on the name of it, but it was about that. Well, these... They're like immigrants. Uh, the point is like he basically he turns into an orphan like he's lost his family he's like looking for his family he's like this optimistic kid um 
who like believes he's going to find his family and then he like gets super discouraged at the end and he finds himself in this place called orphan alley and it makes me cry every time i see it because he's like he's he's uh it's like when you see him lose hope you see like a little kid lose hope because all the other orphans keep making fun making fun of his hope yeah and they're like ah, i stopped looking for my parents a long time ago because if they wanted to find me they would have found me. and it, it's like messes me up because i'm like dude these kids are like young and they're talking about i got it was a long time ago and yeah. uh and it's like, and then it, it, then it just hit me. I'm like, man, I judge people who don't even know what love is. Yep. You know, like these people don't like, how could I judge someone for being cruel when, you know, it was a limp biscuit said, I know why the world hates me. Cause hate is all the world seen lately. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so, the philosophical but, uh, words of Fred Durst. <laughs> yeah. uh, come on, great American poet Fred Durst. <laughs> uh, but it's it's true, and so like why why would I judge somebody who had has not known love? Yeah. Why would I not just be love? You know. So yeah, John. It's like a bunch of orcs just like just lost hope in finding a family yeah i love that with john in first john, like his first john's letter the first john letter <laughs> he's writing yeah. about like light and light light and love right light life and yeah. love and it's like when you don't know christ you don't have love you have like yeah. feelings and temporary emotions and stuff and you can call what you experience love, but you have not experienced love. Like the action that is love that comes from God, you know, you don't know truth. You might think, you know, truth or like, you know, <laughs> there's just this yeah. absence there that when you don't have God, when you don't have that spiritual connection to God, like you are lacking what you need. And it's true. I love that what you said because yeah. it, it is tough to judge those people that don't have that yet. Because you're judging these people for being like liars or being wrong or being stupid. It's like, but they don't know God yet. You have to start with yeah. that. You know, you're judging them for their like the result of the problem. <laughs> you know, like I don't know the right phrasing for that, but like the problem is they don't have a relationship with God. Therefore, X, yeah. Y, and Z is occurring. And you can't blame like X, Y, and Z occurring without addressing the root problem. Like they need to be reunited with their, with their creator. And yeah, they don't. Yeah. And we're also talking about Christians too. (laughs) What? So we're also talking about Christians too. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, there's anyone can call themselves a Christian, but are you reunited with your creator? Like that's a big difference, you know? And, you know, people would call me not a Christian. You know, they might hear that word universalist come out of your mouth and say, you're not a, well, he, I, I always knew he wasn't a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> right? So there's like certain things where like people can judge you, but like, I don't know. There's truly yeah, a difference between, or not a difference, but it's not wise to judge those people who are secular. It's tough to do that. It's tough to, to not hate them and want to outcast them or not associate with them or stay away from them or whatever. But like, we need to be praying for them. We need to have mercy on them. And we need to like start with the root of the problem. The core issue here is they need to be reunited with their creator instead of yeah, man. venom spewing out of our mouths and judgments and hatred and you need to change and you need to do this and do that. It's, I don't know, we're going too far the solution again is is pretty simple and we're going off on the deep end of (laughs) prescriptions for pains that maybe maybe not even there well that's i mean that's just it too i believe it's like you look at the world and i can see like abortion and homosexuality and all this stuff is happening and it seems to be one of two responses it either seems to be like you're an outcast now and you're no longer welcome here or you just do you 
you know and i think it's not either of those i think it's like uh i see people who don't know what love is and people who've been abused you know and it's like into and so many people treat these women who's who get abortions and like with a bludgeon you know it's like uh no these women are you know when they say my body my choice what they mean is i live in a world where i don't feel respected and i as a man who doesn't feel respected in a lot of areas in life can understand this <laughs> you know it's like and um and to not take this hard political lens, but to like look at the heart of what's happening. And this is a woman who's saying, I don't have much control in my life. And I have uh, made mistakes and I don't know how to say that. But I have this area of control that I can control and I can make this sacrifice that's going to, you know, anyways, you can get into it. It's pretty dark, but like, and it's upside down and it's, it's, it's wicked what's happening. But the women are victims as well, you know, and to treat these like women's as if, I, I don't know, like to just beat them over the head. It's like, it's not going to work. They need to be shown love. Like, uh, like if like uh, uh, homosexuals who have been abused, they, uh, they need to be shown like love. Like I've found in my life with the monsters that I've known, if you can just like sit there and be if you can be unmoved in their storm something changes in them like because i've i've had um i don't want to say names <laughs> um but i've had people like ah, like in my face yelling and ranting and venting about stuff and kind of implying that i'm a part of it um and i i just for especially this particular person I have just nothing but love for and I just sat there for like dude like 20 minutes in this like hellhole of screaming yeah. and I just was unmoved because I just had compassion yeah. and it wasn't like we were in a private setting so it wasn't like I had to like like dude you need to relax like we're, we're gonna get the cops called us but like uh, <laughs> uh, uh but he like stopped in the middle of it and you could see like it sobered him up to i because i was just like i hear you you know it was like yeah like i hear you i don't agree with everything you're saying but like i hear you like yeah. you have a reason to be angry ah oh, god I don't know. <sighs> ah people have reasons to be angry and if you can look the monster in the eye and be unmoved by it the monster like dissolves a little bit yeah. Oh, yeah. when they want to make a monster out of you so when you don't join them on that level when your voice doesn't match theirs and rise and you're not meeting their venom with more venom you know you're just coming at it with just truth and love it destabilizes it <laughs> yeah. it throws the the train the the high speed train barreling out of control down the tracks like off course you know they don't know what to do like they're expecting a certain reaction which is yeah. not what we are called to do <laughs> it's match that reaction right we we're supposed to go yeah. them and meet them with love and service and like you said just like honestly hear them out like be there show care for them you don't have to, it doesn't mean agree with them that doesn't mean appease them or you know tell them what they want to hear necessarily but like just be there and shine light and love and truth through you onto them, regardless of what they're doing to you, like accusing you, <laughs> hating you, spreading rumors about you, trying to bring yeah. you down, you know, just refuse. Just stay there confident. Like, yeah, keep the other planted cheek, firmly, like... yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 turn the other cheek. Because there's something so, uh... and it's like, I have like, you know, I'm this has been such a like I grew up in the church you know it's it's always in, interesting it's it's funny to me that you probably have better theology than I do um and you're like a new Christian <laughs> and I, grew, I grew up in the church um but it, it happens a lot yeah <laughs> but even still like not yeah, well, it's like yes and no I just I'm obsessed with it I'm like a, I was a history philosophy major you know, so I like really dove in. Yeah. Like I became a Christian. And it's like for the last th 
four years, three and a half years, I've just been nothing but like aggressively reading the Bible, <laughs> debating it, you know, yeah. learning all the ins and outs. Yeah. And like I said, like I'll, I'll read like a chapter and I'll say, what do the Orthodox have to say about this? What do the Catholics have to say? What is this person? You know, I'm like always listening to sermons and podcasts and stuff. That Does that make me a better Christian? <laughs> does that make me correct like no <laughs> it's just what i do and i just like doing it you know yeah but i get that too with like people i meet and yeah. they're like i can't believe you they'll hear they'll, they'll meet me they'll like understand like how much knowledge i have i guess wisdom i have about the bible and then i'll tell mm -hmm. them like i'm only been a christian for like three years i was a lifelong born degenerate heathen you know <laughs> my whole yeah. life like so ignorant of the bible my whole life and it blows them away. Like they literally think, like, "Oh, I, we assumed you were a preacher's son or something, or you know, went to seminary school because you." Oh know Lord so Almighty, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's like preacher's kid. If you've ever met a preacher's kid, but <laughs> they're you the hot mess. <laughs> but it's like so. Then even at the end of the day, people can look at me and go, "Like, man, you're so wise. Man, you're this. You're this. You're this." And it's like, no, I'm still wrong. I'm still a sinner. I still fall short. I still learn things every day. I still correct myself every day. You know. And we're not running a sprint. We're running yeah. a marathon. Talk to me in 60 years, and I will still be saying the same thing. Like, no, I'm still being corrected. I'm still learning. I'm still growing, you know? That's everyone's journey. It's just different. We're at different legs of the marathon. I might be on mile three. You might be on mile two. But, like, we're all going to the same place, and none of us are better for getting there faster or quicker or easier, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, sorry for the rant. <laughs> no, just no, come I'm in just and smack you with a punch in the face with a, with a Sean rant. Oh, no, you... <laughs> no, that's what I'm here for. I it was making me think, I was trying to collect my thoughts on it. I have a, I'm a little bit uh, touched and special. It takes me a while to get my thoughts on it. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say earlier about um, kind of just some stuff we were saying was for the last few years, I've been a big Paul guy. <laughs> been a big Paul guy, you know? And we don't have to get into the whole thing. But like, <laughs> just the point I'm trying to make is like, I was really into Paul because Paul's story was my story. And yeah. I love the beauty of Paul, which is like that true aspect of redemption where Paul writes mm -hmm. like even a man like me, you know, like just that like profoundness, like even me, even a guy like mm -hmm. me, a murderer of Christians, like the enemy on this earth of Christian, even a guy like me can turn things around. Not only be redeemed, yeah. not only have salvation for my sins, but then turn things around so much and like basically go on to like be a disciple maker for billions of Christians. That's so <laughs> profound. Like that's so inspiring to me. Because when I became a Christian, like, that's my struggle was I was like, me, you know, like, do you know how bad I've been, God? And like, still, I just, again, it's like, all I have to do is just have faith and believe in you. It can't be that easy. You know, I have this like lingering guilt. Like there's, I, I need to do so much to make up for what I've done. But that beauty of Paul and like in his writings and his teachings or not teachings, I guess, but his, his epistles, his writings, his revelations, I guess to the church are exactly what I needed to hear for the first three years of my journey. Mm -hmm. But lately I've been becoming a Peter guy. <laughs> so now yeah. after like that, after this is all resolved, now that I am like a Christian and I'm like plugged into churches and fellowship groups and I'm, I've read the Bible a couple times. And like, like I was just saying and ranting about, like I am really into theology and diving into the meanings of things and talking about it. But now when I read the Bible, I relate much more to Peter, who is right there with Jesus and has faith. And he's so like on fire, but he continues to fall. <laughs> he just fails. You know, it's like he's right there. He gets out of the boat. He starts walking on water and then he like loses his faith and falls. You know, and it's like to me, that's the most like now I'm relating so much to Peter where it's like. I'm here. I have faith. I'm on mission. I'm ready, God. Tell me what to do. I will grab a sword and fight for you. I'm ready. Tell me what you need me to do. And God's like, 
uh, just don't deny me. And then tomorrow I'm like denying him three times before the rooster crows, you know? It's like, oh, I'll yeah. never deny you. Oh, God, no, I'm your number one warrior. I'm here for you always. And then tomorrow it's like, okay, go talk to that guy. Or go call that friend, that awkward friend that, you know, I need you to, to share the gospel with. And I'm like, uh, that's, that's a little <laughs> uncomfortable. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I now feel like Peter. Yeah. And I feel like Christians relate differently, too. Like, and then even we were talking about John, where John is almost the epitome of, like, what we should be wanting to do, which is, like, just there. Just resting. Just having faith. Like, John doesn't slip up and fail because he's so simply just being there. And Peter's like trying to do the most and then falling short, you know? And then Paul's there like, I was the worst guy ever. <laughs> now I'm yeah. good, you know? And it's because of Christ. And so I do feel like you can, even at different seasons or different stages of your life, relate to like the different people like of the Bible who all three of those people and all of the, you know, disciples hum were so humble about it. It's like these amazing guys who should be bragging and boasting and like, they always in their writings have to like check themselves and be like, Hey, I'm just a guy. Hey, I'm just a fisherman. Hey, I was a murderer. Hey, I was, you know, it's like, they're not sitting here boasting about how great they are and how awesome they are. It's actually like very humble and very relatable to us or for us. Except for John. Well, yeah, I mean, he calls himself the beloved of Christ. <laughs> yeah, he also won the foot race against Peter. Don't forget that. Don't leave that out of the... <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> he race against Peter? Yeah, when they were going to see uh, the tomb, the empty tomb. And uh, John and Peter... Oh, raced. yeah, yeah. John made sure to include that there was a race and that he won it. <laughs> Don't That's forget hilarious. that. Don't leave that out. Remember... Dude, I won that race. <laughs> <laughs> I beat Peter in that race. Don't do not forget that everyone that's going to come after me in history. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. I never even thought. Guess what? I love. I think John, the Gospel of John is like my favorite. No, there's no other because John 17 and and um or you know that prayer that he prayed for himself his disciples and those who come after him they, um and just the little the stuff that you know john 1 1 the whole opening of john and you know the little details like the blood the one who jesus loved and like a little detail like that that he made sure to include that he beat peter i feel like he was just like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this awesome book um that really broke down john and his writings and like yeah. told you like it, it really broke down like the book of john and then the first you know the three letters he had to the church of ephesus and just in detail with breaking down like his writing style and his themes and like why he included certain things and why he didn't and it's so like profound and then i actually just uh i Kind of debating like bringing it up and like doing a stream about it but i found this college textbook i had when i was in college for two years <laughs> before dropping out but i took like a religion class and there's this textbook i have from it that's basically like it just it's basically just an anti-christian textbook and it's just so wrong and like it's so yeah. weirdly blatantly wrong and like the claims they were making was that like nobody knows who wrote the gospels there's no way we can prove they're basically saying like most of the people, um, like, you know, like, let's say Luke, a guy named Luke didn't write the book of Luke. Someone wrote the book of Luke. And in that day, it was common to attribute it to Luke. It's like, no, there's actually a guy named Luke <laughs> who traveled with Paul. He was a doctor and he wrote the gospel of Luke. You know, there's like, it's yeah. just weird how they're like really twisting and denying this stuff. And especially with John, when they're like this, this textbook is claiming like, uh, we don't really know who wrote the book of John. It's like, no, it was John. <laughs> it was John. And we know because of like these specific things, like these themes he has yeah. in his writing, you know? And it just yeah, like, yeah. goes to show like, I don't know if that's just so blatantly anti-God that they're just willing to just lie like that. Or do they not see? Like back to the vision thing. Like, are they so blinded 
by not having truth and love in their life that they are just spewing nonsense, like regurgitating nonsense, whether they believe it or not, you know? I don't know. It's interesting. It's interesting to see how, like, so blatantly wrong someone could be about something that, like, all you have to do is just read these books. <laughs> it's there. It's like you don't have to change things, the contact, you don't have to manipulate it. You don't have to have, like, a secret book with a secret codex decipher ring to uncover. It's like, it's just there. It's the book yeah. of John <laughs> and his letters. And you can tell it's, you know, and the book of Revelation. You can tell it's the same guy. It's this guy. His name is John, you know. I don't know. John the Revelation. Yeah, no, I hear you. And that's, I, I think this is a real, uh, I don't know what you call it, a carnal desire to want to understand God in order to be like him. But that is the garden and the Eden, you know, this and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Like you will gain a knowledge. Um, and then you will be like him instead of remembering what God said that I was made in his image and likeness. And that's one of the things that fascinates me about Eve is that the lie, the first lie she had to believe was that she was not already like God. Yeah. And I think there's something about that. I think it all comes back to like, you know, resting on Jesus like uh, John did is like be just being there. And, you know, because, like, I called, like, this past summer, man, it was, like, the summer of stumble. Like, I preached. I know you missed it. You weren't there to see my great revelatory <laughs> message. And then, um, yeah. but, uh, I missed two hours I, of the I, festival, I, and it was the one hour that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was preached about Peter, and, you know, because I, I compared him to, I even talked about, uh, I think he was, I don't want to mess up, miss, uh, misgender the cartoonist, but it was, like, I can't remember. I think it was hometown there who did uh, the uh, Mel Gibson is friends with Jesus. <laughs> like Mel Gibson foils Jesus's plans because he's so enthusiastic. And I was like, <laughs> I'm like, Peter's like literally. You know, I think Peter is, is his enthusiasm. It's like he just enthusiastically fake over and over again. Yeah. And, you know, and I think it's like, this is another thing that I I'll end up getting emotional about. Unless like maybe I can call myself out on it and not, but like, is how much like, you know, he, you know, he's the only one who got out of the boat, right? And walked on the water. And then he, he and then he gets like, you know, ribbed by Jesus. He's like, you have little faith. It's like, I just walked on the water. I'm the only one who did it besides you. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm like, and uh, and then on the Mount of Transfiguration, they're like, you know, Moses and Elijah, they're, you know, they're all beaming with, like, light. Yeah. And he's like, uh, I'll, I'll build a, you want me to make something? I'll start. <laughs> he's like, yeah. what, what, what do I need to do? He's like, I'll build um, us houses and we can live here forever. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just uh, like, stop. He's like, just <laughs> relax. <laughs> Calm yeah. down. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, you know, like, oh no, Jesus, don't wash my feet. And then he's like, well, you know, and then, and then the, and then the next breath, he's like, Oh, well then wash all of me. You know, it's like, just, just chill. Would you, you know, <laughs> you can see like the other people kind of get annoyed with Peter, but that's what I like about him. It's just like, he's just there, you know, he's, he's the only guy who he's, and this is what really touched me about Peter was that, man, this hit me like a ton of, and it was that Peter wanted Jesus for himself and he like, yeah. couldn't let go. He couldn't let go of Jesus. And to the point where he's like, the only one who defended him physically, he's like, no, you can't take, this is my brother. You're going to take my, well, no, like, we're doing this together. We're going to take over Rome. We're going to take over the world. Yeah. You know, and he's like, you'll never take this guy from us. Um, and, uh, you know, then he, he cut off a man's ear uh, and Jesus healed it. I mean, how embarrassing is that for Peter? Um, and then, like, at the point to where it's like he did all this, he kept messing up, 
and he's like, you know, I love, you know, he's always talking about how much he loves Jesus. And then he keeps messing up and keeps getting humiliated. And then it's just the point where it's like, he didn't, he, you know, I think the contrast of Peter's the one who chopped off the man's ear that was coming to take Jesus away. And Jesus healed his ear and then he, Jesus got taken away. And at that point, I think Peter didn't even remember what Jesus said about denying him. He just in his head was like, what can I, I can't do anything for him. Like what I, you know, it's like, I can't stop him. Like he's like, you won't listen. Um, they're going to take him. And it just was like, what there was only the only thing left for Peter to do at that point was to deny Jesus. I think it's like he tried and he tried and he tried and then he gave up. I think it's such a beautiful conclusion to the fallen nature of Peter. But then Peter was also the one, like the last interaction with him, I think it said he caught his eyes after he denied him. That's his last interaction with Jesus before his death. And then his first interaction after the resurrection is him diving out of a boat to go be with the one he rejected. And it's because he knew how good he was. He's like, that's what I love about Peter is that nothing was going to keep him from the good news. Nothing was going to keep him from Jesus. You know, I think that's just a beautiful, uh, that's why I love Peter. And that's why I've really identified with Peter this year. I'm kind of moving into, I think, I didn't, I didn't never think I'd be at a John phase, but I feel like I'm kind of <laughs> part of a John phase these days. Get over your Peter phase and into your John phase, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's um. that, um, it really is the epitome of like the sanctification process. Like that becoming holy process yeah. that you have after becoming a believer, right? So you're like, okay, I believe, now what? And now it's like tr- that trial and error phase of like, you're trying to be righteous and then you fall. And then you try to be righteous and then you fall. You know, everyone has that. Everyone's on that. And that's so yeah. relatable. That's Peter. Peter's the yeah. epitome of that, you know? Um, it's like he so bet- gets it. And then it's like, no, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> come on. But then we, feel- we see him in Acts. So then we pick up and in, in, pick up the story, right? So after what you're saying, like his last encounter with Christ is... Again, the eyes, the gaze of Christ, <laughs> meeting him in that moment. Yeah. But then it's like Acts, he ushers in the founding of the church, you know, the found ushering in the, the Holy Spirit, like the baptizing of like all these people, right? He starts to do everything right. And maybe yeah. not everything perfectly, but he starts to like do things right. He's learned from his trial and error. Like his sanctification process hasn't stopped and his faith yeah. is stronger. And now when they come to arrest him, he goes, take me. I will gladly be taken, (laughs) you know, instead of, oh, no, 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 not me. I don't know, you know, and it's the epitome of all of all of our processes of becoming more holy. Like you're going to fall. You're going to fail. But you have to get back up. You have to have that Peter like excitement to get back up and prove yourself the next time. And then when you fall be like Peter again and get back (laughs) and try, you know, keep doing it. And then eventually like in that process, you will find yourself eventually at a state where like you aren't really falling. You aren't really failing. And you're like, now you're fishing for men. You're fishing for others to disciple. You've become the disciple maker, not the disciple. Right. Yeah. See, I'm in a big Peter phase in my life. (laughs) Right now. I love Peter, man. I used to be a big Paul guy. Now I'm a big Peter guy. (laughs) It's interesting how it kind of happens like that. I imagine that John probably pissed Peter off. He's like, dude, this guy is so chill. And like, Jesus loves him so much. Like, he's like, because if I, if I, if you could attack me, like on, there's a few things that you could disparage me and it hurt my feelings. Uh, <laughs> but like, I think one of the things I just came to terms with in my life was like, dude, I am a tryhard. <laughs> like, I'm just a tryhard yeah. <laughs> um, about certain things, at least some things. I'm not a tryhard at all. But <clears throat> well, I like John you can call too. me a tryhard. That's huh? I, well, I love that. Like John is so chill. 
He's so cool and chill and factual. Except for the when he gets the Sons of Thunder nickname, because he's just like, let's go kill that person. <laughs> like out of nowhere, John just in the middle of like the gospel is just like, hey Jesus, let's rain some hellfire down on that dude for just kind of like looking at you wrong. <laughs> but he's like, yeah, for yeah. saying the wrong thing to you on the road. Kill that man. Make him hurt. Make him. <laughs> like, dude, John, calm down. <laughs> All right. Where did that come from? And then it just disappears. It's just kind of gone. He's just kind of chill after that again. But he had that He's one like, okay. moment where he just like really wanted Jesus to just <laughs> rain hellfire down on some dude, you know? Let's go, Jesus, do it! <laughs> Now's the time. He's like, this guy, are you serious? Like Jesus, like, whoa. You wanted me to rain down hellfire. This is kind of a random moment, John. <laughs> And then I see that too as almost like a mocking nickname, Sons of Thunder. You know, it's like almost like yeah, you you guys are the ones like wanting Hellfire, like two fishermen. I think this is hilarious. <laughs> two just like fishermen, like young teenage boys. Like, calm down, dude. John, go sit down. <laughs> sons of Thunder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sons of Thunder that. over here. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like a mocking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was another thing too it's like dang like, don't write that one down an interesting thing about john in that book i mentioned which i bring this up and people just either don't even believe me or they just didn't know but john so at the end so at the end when jesus is on the cross and he turns to john and he says i forget exactly the wording but he's like this like this is now your mom like he's telling John, like John's the only male disciple there. And he's looking at his mom, Jesus, like Mary. And he's saying, she's now your mom. Take care of her. Like I can't, I no longer obviously am going to be able to take care of her on this earth. You now take my position and take care of, of Mary. And when he does that, John is 16 years old. I'm sorry, 14 years old. Like... And he was that young? I did not realize John was that young. See, this always happens. No one, un like, he's the youngest disciple, but he was 14 at the moment of the crucifixion. That's pretty intense. <laughs> That's pretty young, you know, to, like, be traveling That's with really Jesus. Cool. And he was just, like, a fisherman. Like, he was, his whole life was he was just going to be, like, a fisherman. John, until Jesus was like, hey, come guy. with me. What? So, John, what a guy. I, well, yeah, then it's pretty like so. Then all of a sudden, he has now been entrusted with probably some of the most <laughs> responsibility any man could ever be entrusted with, and he's just like some fourteen-year-old boy, like standing in the desert, <laughs> just like looking at Jesus, like being br brutally, shame shamefully crucified. You know, what's got to be going through his head is he's still just there, again, just there, <laughs> just in faith. When no one else was, when all you know, when guys like Peter like left and abandoned him, he's just yeah. there. And then Christ is still giving him like jobs to do, and he's like, "Okay, yes, I will do that." He's fourteen. <laughs> That's so amazing to me. Like all the disciples were young. I do feel like people kind of think of them as older. Like they were all teenagers and in their twenties. Yeah, is I did not realize. Remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> pretty yeah. wild and crazy how young they all were but then how like profound they ended up being like how much responsibility they took up how much risk they took like doing yeah. that like leaving their lives and their jobs and their careers behind and like following you know because didn't john write his gospel like later on after the others I'm not sure when he wrote that. Yeah, I know that when he wrote the letters to uh, Ephesus, which we know is like the first John, second John, third John letters, I think it was in 80, mm -hmm. 80 AD, so like 10 years after the fall of Jerusalem. And then he wrote Revelation in like 90s sometime. What a lie. Like the very end of his life, yeah. But he was like really old, like 70 or 80 or something when he wrote that. Dude, just the uh, the idea. I, I, this is another thing where I'm like about like how good God is. Like people just don't. I don't think understand how good. Because I'm like, just imagine the best case scenario ever. Like if you could just imagine, just keep imagining how good it could be, and then just know that it's better. <laughs> 
you know? Yeah. And people are like, because I it's like, oh, because heaven going to be like good, you know? Or like, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to be like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you're gonna be like, oh my God. You know, like, because in my head, I just personally think, because this is how I might, like, I think, you know, because I don't know really, but what I think is like everybody's going to be 33 years old in heaven, you know, and like in really good shape. Yeah. And then you like meet your granddad, right? And he's like, he's like a young man, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. wow, you know. Um, and this is another thing that like I, I, uh, I'd be interested to drop in your ear is this anti-materialism I think is kind of is is missing the mark a bit because I again like I'm not like a materialist if anything I'm like too anti-materialist I think like I almost don't care enough about money um and so I think that there's like there's something about the transfiguration and the idea that God enfleshed himself so that we could have a relationship with him. And he is like a, a I, I, you know, I think that's what it means that he's at the right hand of the father is because like he is our, um, I don't, I'm going to get lost in all that uh, perichoresis talk, but like, um, but uh, what am I talking about? Jeez. There's something about the material that the, the um, like, I mean, he ascended in his flesh, I think, didn't he? Yeah. I'm not saying he's like f flesh and bone as like necessarily as we are, but like, we were made in his image right. and um i don't know i just think there's something to the material that is like is fallen and decayed and perverted but i think should be glorified and i don't know what that means because it's like when you get to heaven are things no longer material is everything just invisible i don't you know i, I it's like what because I, I kind of think of it as in like in terms of like more like love or something like love is a currency that you can hold like fiat you know it's like a it's like a tangible material thing and i don't know this is just my head thinking this is not theology but it just would make sense to me that the m material does not go away i mean it even describes like the different like uh, the foundations of heaven are these different uh, gems and rocks and stuff like that but I don't know I feel like there's this anti-materialism to where it's just like material is bad when God made it and said it was good and I'm kind of on this kick right now where I'm like I feel like I just kept spending so much time uh, talking trash about things that God made and things that God loves you know, it's like, yeah. I don't know. I feel like there's like, uh, um, the flesh cannot please him. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I just think there's something to it that is, uh, something that I don't understand certainly, but I think there's something to it that just shouldn't be cast away. I think there's something about even the transfiguration. That's why it's like, I think that the race of heaven is light. Uh, that's a weird tangent to go on, but that's kind no. of nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I do find myself on that too, where I'm just like everything physical is bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. But then, yeah, like w what you kind of said is like, I mean, read the first chapter of the Bible. God is sitting here creating things in the physical world and calling it good. Yeah. <laughs> like thing after thing. He's creating physical things that are still in existence in our world. He's saying, it is good. <laughs> it is good. Yeah. It is good. And then, so what? I'm supposed to like look at the sun and be like, it's bad because it's here. <laughs> Trees are bad. It's material. Here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm bad because I exist, you know? It's like, no. 
don't think you have to be that extreme about it. But yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, fi- I, do, I do do that, though. I do find myself on that end of like, well, this is all bad. But then I have to yeah. rein myself back in and be like, no, that's not necessarily the case. And too, yeah, like, like I'm mean, not trying to be a dork. I used to hate this stuff, but like I'm like, dude, I'm all about the whatever is good. I'm like about it, you know. I'm just uh, I, I used to think that was like for soft, you know, milk toast Christians, and I think a lot of it is. But this is the thing. It's like you know all this like self love generation. Truths are fair. If there's this is a perverted version of it, you know? And it's like, the thing is, is to, it's like the me, me, me generation is the perverted version of John saying, I'm his favorite, you know? Yeah. It's like me. Like, I understand the power of, say, of saying I'm his favorite, you know? And it not being a threat to anybody else. It's like, um, or like getting in the way. It's like, uh, I don't know. Something I just so I, I don't I'm not I'm not trying to be it's like I've come full circle contrarian to where I'm like contrarian to the contrarian you know I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're the hater <laughs> for the haters yeah yeah the devil to the devil's advocate it's like <laughs> yeah uh, I was like that with um and I I've always kind of like Jesse Lee Peterson he's always helped me. He, he helped me big time with a lot of things in my life, you know. Yeah. But there's things I just disagree with him on. Sure. Then it's like, and then there's things I really agree with him on, but maybe not all the way, and I get wrapped up with it. But he's very big into, like, anti-ego. Like, killing your ego, suppressing your ego. Like, no ego. Ego is evil, is what he says. And there's, like, a lot of truth to that. Mm-hmm. You know? It's like, it rings so true. And so then you, then you get on a mission... Where you're like, I'm going to kill my ego. I got to get rid of my ego is, is killing me. I got to kill it before it kills me, you know. And you just become yeah. so anti-ego, which like, maybe that's a good thing. Is to not just let your ego run unchecked and just be totally sure. unaware of it. Think it's a good thing, you know. But like, do you yeah. have to leap to that extreme of like, it's bad no matter what in all circumstances and I need to destroy it. Like, maybe there's some kind of common ground there. Like, maybe, yeah, the ego isn't great. (laughs) But maybe there's times where we need it. Maybe we're given it for a reason. Maybe, like, we have to learn how to control it and use it for good. Not just let it, like, ruin our lives, you know? So I I do jump to those extremes where I'm like, obviously something's up with the ego. And we need to, like, keep it in check. And it leads us astray. But, like, does that mean just go totally in one direction you're just like kill it suppress it make it not exist don't ever let it control you or are we is it something that we all need do we all need a little bit of ego in our lives because we are individuals on an individual journey with individual roles to play created uniquely for individual unique reasons in god's plan you know being one one drop in the bucket so like there's times i think where like the ego is needed but yeah, it's like that whole idea of like the flesh is bad. It's like, but also God made marriage <laughs> and, you know, the joint, like a, like a marriage union where two people can join and create new life together. Mm-hmm. Is that bad? Did you just create something bad? Did you marry something <laughs> bad? Like, obviously these extremes aren't it where it's all or nothing, black or white. Yeah. It's obviously like there's middle grounds, but it's how why <laughs> the, f- the philosophical yes. problem or questions that follow is how why can you should you but yeah I yeah the same problem yeah well it's funny like i in college i had a speech class and um we all were working independently of each other and it just as a, a maybe the teacher set it up because she knew what was going to happen but we did not know this was the way it was going to play out, but I get up and I, you know, I get a, I give a speech on the virtues of selflessness. And, you know, it's like, uh, you know, all the girls liked it. They're like, Oh, that's really sweet. You know? 
and it's like very thoughtful and it was it's good but um um <laughs> and um and then i sat down and then the next guy after me uh gave a speech on selfishness and uh and it was brilliant he did a whole speech on like selfishness and uh why selfishness is good and it was like wild like it was uh it, it was hilarious too we we're all laughing at it and it was just it was funny how well those two things fit together it was selfless selfish selflessness and selfishness and um because i think there is you know you die to yourself and um you know, and you know your will not mine more of you less of me there is that but there's also the um um there you go man i forgot what i was gonna say um Less of you, more of me. There's the uh... there you go. I don't know. <laughs> I had a nice conclusion to that. Um... So I don't the 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 speeches. There's the uh... man. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop it. Maybe I'll think of it. <laughs> yeah, I got really into Anne Rand for a few years. You know, I read, yeah. read Atlas Shrug and read, um, uh, I can't even think of the name of it. The one about the architect. Um, you know, you just read a couple of Ayn Rand books and you're like, whoa, <laughs> it blows your mind. Where it's like, be selfish. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's pretty much the core philosophy yeah. is like, be selfish, <laughs> indulge your ego, live for yourself. But she yeah. makes these really compelling points that are so true, where it's like, these people oh, yeah. who pretend to be selfless, they're not. It's bad. Yeah. It's you're pretending. Because you can't be selfless. Your whole life yeah. is you. You're acting as you. And That's like, why I say all the people that are anti-material, I'll take it. Yeah, it's like you're saying this with physical, a physical mouth. <laughs> physical, yeah. se- like you're, you're physical using vibrations out of your mouth to convey a message that being in the physical is bad you know it's like how yeah. could you <laughs> logically do that yeah but i think it's some this, i i, I remember I, I remember yeah, yeah i think it for me it, it's best summed up this way the selfishness and selflessness it's that um i love because first i was loved and that in order to love my neighbor as myself to do that best i must love myself and in order to love myself, I must see my I must see me not as I am necessarily, but as God sees me outside of time perfected in Christ. Now that's a lot of church jargon, but like I think you could understand and that's not maybe how I would unpack that in a different way. Um, uh, but I think maybe you, you understand what I mean that yeah. in order to love neighbor best, if, if I'm to to take the command of Jesus and love my neighbor as myself, then it would be best to love me, so I could then love my neighbor better. Right. Um, <laughs> so carry on. I just was so no, glad no, I remember. Yeah, no, it's exactly. And then <laughs> in the chat, my boy Eli Script, who always comes back and <laughs> always has like the best like Bible verses in my in my chat, or it reins me in sometimes when I'm rambling a little bit just said something I agree and disagree with at the same time, and it's going to make my point here. said, the ego is the false self and must be put to death every moment so the life of Christ can be lived through you. And he says, Luke 9, 23, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And it's like, yes, right? On the surface, yes, so true. Like, kill yourself, deny yourself, let Christ live in and through you. And it's like, yes, true. But also that phrase, like, look at what's in this phrase. And he said to them, if any man shall come after him, let him deny himself, you know, and take up his cross, right? Like, you can't not be yourself, right? Like, Christ is calling you 
as an individual to take up your cross and carry it, you then have to like be an individual. You have to live your own life and your own journey. Christ is calling you to, yeah, like mm-hmm. at, at on some level, like kill your ego, but also like you have to have an ego in order to take up your cross and carry it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like a weird, I don't know where the right explanation is or even where the real like reality line is but like obviously like the ego is bad but obviously we need it for some reason and i don't know how or why or when or where like what the rhyme or reason is but it's like this it's like yes i totally fully agree and it is so true like christ is saying deny yourself but also he's telling you (laughs) the individual named (laughs) sean or you know t chad uh, <laughs> Mr. Grindstaff, uh, <laughs> he's telling you to pick up your cross and carry it. So if you kill your yeah. ego, then like you don't exist, and then you, there is no cross for you to pick up because you don't exist and you don't have a cross, you know? So there is like a fine balance of like, yeah, I do think like we need to check ourselves, but also don't wreck yourself. <laughs> don't go too far in the extreme and get wrecked, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh yeah no i'm with you i think i agree it's uh i think it just is i think what we're doing is casting i don't, I don't know this is where my mind starts getting real like uh almost esoteric it's like um because uh, it's uh i think it has to do with time and how we exist in time and what is outside of time and how God sees us within and outside of time um, and I think that's even what healing is supposed to be is like a reconciliation of who like I am or a sick person is with who their perfected self is in Christ I think it's like a, a, a meshing of time in like heaven it's like when heaven uh enters how we perceive is now and is not later but is now and that now there is no tomorrow or yesterday but that there is only now because now is forever and forever is now you know this is this is where my head you know when i talk about being trapped in my own head it's like this is the guy's <laughs> like i'm like now is now and <laughs> my head um eternity healing and perfection outside of time third dimension um <laughs> anyways but uh yeah because I, I, I think the the fullest self the realization of who we cause, well i say that because i think there is a fallen self that we are dying to and realizing ourselves. but there is an but the the whole point it's like so we are dying to self but we are found in Christ. We are not him, but we are found in him and our identity is found in him. So we have an identity. And I think there's something very important and special to God about the individual. So there's these ideas like the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. These are collective terms, you know, Um, but then, but none of those will happen before there is an established individual because God very much cares about you you know he he cares about me because i'm his favorite you know and um (laughs) uh, and uh and just to be like there with him in a very special personal place where i am me i'm i'm the most me i'm the best me i'm the me he created me to be and not the fallen version of that I think that's what that's all about. So it's like, I don't really know what ego means, I suppose. I I feel like it may be a bad, it may be good to describe some things, but maybe it's, maybe it's not. um, I don't know if the ego is, I don't know. Maybe there's a better term for it. Maybe not, but um, I, cause I know what you mean. It is good to, I I think we're in agreement. (laughs) I guess. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's the the another thing Jesse says. Jesse Lee Peterson says is all thoughts are lies, and that is something I I still do agree with him on. And for me, it's hard to not do that because like you are not your thoughts, which is 
it seems it seems weird <laughs> it seems wrong but just think about that just keep thinking about that linger on that like you and anyone watching this now or like later you're watching a replay of this four years from now you're not your thoughts like it's so simple it's another thing it seems like so simply so simple it can't be true but it's profound you are you your thoughts yeah. are like temporary like just like you are not your emotions you are not yeah. happiness <laughs> you know what I mean you are not your happiness that's something you experience temporarily you are you and there's clearly like a separation of like thoughts and opinions and feelings that isn't you it's just something that like is in you for a little bit and then leaves like the feeling of being hungry like you are not hungry you feel hungry temporarily yeah. and it's yeah. the same thing with like a thought like your thoughts are just in you for right now <laughs> and they're gonna like be out of you soon you know they come and go but we get so yeah. and the reason why jesse's all about it is he's like all he's all thoughts are lies and he wants you to like do a silent prayer so that you can learn to distinguish like yourself from that and he's pretty much says like be still and know god and the bible does repeat this idea of like it's not necessarily meditation but it's like just be still be calm experience god let go of your thoughts and yourself and your wants your worries and stresses and desires let go and let god just let god fill that void just be there exist with him in his presence you know and it's very hard to do yeah. that and you have to almost train yourself to do that you know through prayer through be like intentional like acts i guess mm -hmm. or repetitions of stuff um practicing it but um <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that either. I'm, I'm, losing, I'm losing my mind in the ramble now. I'm losing my thoughts in the ramble. But just as like the ego, it's like you are yourself, but maybe your thoughts about yourself don't exist. There are these temporary things. Like you thinking about yourself is kind of the problem. Not necessarily that like you are yourself. Like you have a self. You are you, but your thoughts about you are the problem or <laughs> what need to be killed what need to be crucified you know <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i like what you, i like how you said it earlier kill yourself <laughs> <laughs> so that's don't all those that. kids online when i was playing call of duty back in the day you are like kill yourself they're just like so they're just sharing the gospel with yeah <laughs> they, they actually wanted the best for you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they actually yeah. loved you and cared about you and respected you why don't Man, you live God well bless forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like earlier in the chat. I missed this, but Slap Weasel earlier said uh, he does hate intolerance and the Antichrist and the French. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Love that. Um, my my Nana, she's from uh, England. She's born. In uh, England and uh, she she does not like that's the good old fashioned racism you know it's like she does not like French people or France I don't know if she she probably liked the French person but I don't want to speak for her but she would not when everybody's going to they all went to uh, this really funny everybody like all the girl like ladies in the family went to London to visit her like where she grew up and stuff and, uh, and then uh, uh, they all went to Paris, uh, I guess, for a day. And she, my nana was the only one that went. She's like, nope, <laughs> not going. <laughs> Hard pass on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why, nana? I, I don't like the smell. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> French. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, um, I have one final question, but before that, do you have any questions for me? <laughs> any topics? How was you? your day? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a little stressful, but not the end of the world. Just yeah, it was good. <laughs> job site, job site stress, like just working a construction site where it's like. 
kind of not the end of the world, but in the moment, you're just like so stressed out for no reason. <laughs> moving, yeah. moving stuff like trying to set an odd, like you're, you're in like a skid steer with forklift. Basically, you're, you're in a forklift, and you're trying to set something down, and you just can't do it. <laughs> And it's not the end of the world, and you could probably just drop the thing and break it, but you want to just set it a certain way. And you can't get your picks out, yeah. you can't leave it standing up, you can't... It's just so stressful, and it doesn't matter at all. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> the Coffee Ground says uh, in the chat, it's always freaked me out how palpable and constant thoughts are, and they are 0% material. True. What's yeah. up, Coffee Grounds? Yeah. <laughs> coffee Where's he? Uh, he's, he's he's on the dark depths of being banned off everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Getting blacklisted. Getting me blacklisted. And the yeah, AI says again, not. nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Amen. Amen. My boy Eli, thanks for showing up, brother. All right, any uh, any like plugs or shout outs you want the people to hear or know about? No. <laughs> right on. Love that. <laughs> As we're talking about like ego and killing the ego, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Plug your stuff. <laughs> Get people to follow you on TikTok. <laughs> uh, Jesus loves you. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Love that. And Coffee Ground says, I'm a nice guy, I swear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I, yeah. Oh, yeah, you do. I forget you know Coffee Grounds, too. I've been yeah. staring at myself for like two hours. This is torture you put me through. Yeah. <laughs> you survived. You passed the test. Like, I forgot it was you. <laughs> you just like, passed you know, the yeah. test. Um, right on. Yeah, boy. My final, final question for you tonight is, did you have a fun time? I did. I had a good time. Is that what you ask your dates to? Is that your last question for your dates? Yeah, it's usually like I. I You're like I have it. one more question. I have a question for you. <laughs> Was it nice? Yeah. I usually ask that like repeated, repeatedly, and often throughout my dates. Like, are you having a good time? You, you swear. You swear you're having a good time. How about now? Are you having a good time still? <laughs> you doing okay? Can I get you anything? Can I... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It works. Out. I did. Works Thank out you very much out. for having me on. This is great. <laughs> for real, it's awesome. been a, it's been a, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. You're a good guy. Uh, we got to go check out those uh, stars star uh, forts. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, coffee grounds. Let's, let's go hit it up. <laughs> let's do it. We're... Tartaria exploring in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> right on, man. Well, yeah. Thank you. 